Hey everyone, Phil Plisky here from FMS. I'm with one of our functional movement systems instructors, Jenna Gourlay. Jenna, welcome. So glad to be able to chat with you today. Yeah, definitely. So in our last talk, we were talking about telehealth and how it's important to recognize patterns. And even with telehealth, it almost caused you to emphasize patterns of either behavior, patterns of pain. And one of the patterns we talked about was hypermobility. And when we think of hypermobility, I think a lot of people uh, think of the Byton scale. And you, if you're hypermobile, if you have more than five out of nine, and uh, that's what defines hypermobility. I don't know that I've come across that to be the case in my practice. And it's been something I've been studying for the past several years. Uh, what are you finding in the pattern of hypermobility? Yeah, so I definitely think I always start at that bite and criteria, but then there's some other clues that I get along the way. So uh, one big thing would be, you know, somebody that has a straight leg raise, they're going well past 90 all the way to 120 or even, you know, 110. Um, somebody that has a really big arc when you look at their shoulder, um, someone that has subluxed in the past at certain joints. And then those type of people that come in and you do their SFMA and you find a lot of mobility dysfunctions and they all seem to clear up really quickly, but then they seem to almost return just as quickly. Sometimes those people fall into that hypermobile category as well. Absolutely. You know, I think it's, uh, it's one of those things that I see where, you know, usually they do have two or three of the Biden criteria, but then, you know, so like they can, they can, you know, bend their thumb to their forearm or they palm the floor, but then they have those other things that, that are from their history or other physical characteristics where it indicates that hypermobility. That's usually what I find. I, I totally agree with that. I, I think people are missing a lot of hypermobile people just because they're expecting them, you know, to be able to do the splits and their elbows hyperextend 20 degrees on each side. You know, a lot of times I think you're spot on. You know, you see a lot of that shoulder instability combined with a couple other factors, it, it becomes really important. Okay, so if we need to recognize that more, why? I mean, so does that change your treatment or change how you're looking at someone? Yeah, so I think it, it definitely changes the treatment and it makes you start to look at like what their reset might be a little bit differently. So I work with a volleyball team that nearly every single one on that team is very hypermobile. And I would spend all of this time doing, you know, maybe mobilizations or maybe different manual techniques and they would improve somewhat, but they might still have pain after or not improve as much as I thought. And then I realized if I did something like rhythmic stabilization or I did something like an arm bar in a patient that was having shoulder pain, that seemed to help so much more than when I was just either mobilizing or, or trying to do soft tissue for a period of time. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think that's so important because I, I think that's probably the biggest insight I had as a clinician is, you know, we, we all kind of equate, okay, someone who is hypermobile, but remember, we're kind of changing that definition a little bit, that we're not going to do a manipulation or maybe manipulation isn't going to be as effective. What I've learned is not only is that typically not effective for that person, it actually might even cause them to go a step backwards. And then on top of that, the, the choice of, of, of a reset is more something along the stability line. So I'm going to do a PNF hold relax or rhythmic stabilization armbar falls right into that category. Or if I'm going to do a dry needling, I think dry needling, the cool thing about it is it, it, it can have both a facilitatory or an inhibitory effect. And it, it kind of just does what it's supposed to do. And, and so I'm going to lean toward those types of techniques, muscle energy techniques, rather than maybe my specific joint techniques. So I think it's really important uh, that as, as we kind of wrap up here is to understand that, you know, hypermobility isn't just five out of nine or more on the Biton, that it's, it's kind of a cluster of symptoms and signs that probably don't fit. You can't, there's so many different of them. It's more like you have three or four, you know, signs of hypermobility and that kind of puts your, your treatment should be then changed a little bit. And that change really uh, should go toward more of that manual therapy technique that emphasizes stability and motor control over just gaining mobility. The reason they don't have the mobility is because they don't have the stability. So uh, I think this is, this is a great insight. Really appreciate you taking the time to talk. Uh, if you all have any questions uh, for Jenna and I, we'd love to answer them. So just reach out uh, to Functional Movement and we'd be happy to start up a discussion. Sounds good. Hey guys, if you like the video, definitely hit the thumbs up. 
And if you want to stay informed, hit the bell so we can notify you anytime we put up new videos. And of course, any questions or comments, put those at the end. We'll certainly be checking them out and trying to respond. Thanks so much. And remember, always move well and then move often.